So let's start. So I'm very happy today that Drew and DJ Jen, I'm always afraid I'm going to pronounce it wrong. Um, so DJ is going to talk to us about advancing sound accessibility. And I'm personally pretty excited seeing the work that he has done. Um, so DJ is finishing his PhD in computer science and engineering at UW, University of Washington. And he's working on several different areas, publishing in Kai, West, and SF. So those are all very exciting. So I'm not going to say anything more. I will let DJ share his screen so he can start the presentation. Good. Yes. Okay. So you're, you're on mute. DJ, you are on mute. How about now? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Cool. So I think one thing I wanted to add is that if you could delay asking questions to the end of my talk, that would be really appreciated because you know I use subtitles to understand what people are saying uh, as I'm hard of hearing myself. And so if you could just type a question in chat and then have them uh, answer at the end, that would be that would be really great. Uh, but just like um, I can, I won't be able to answer any question in the middle of my talk. Uh, but you know, if there are any kind of issues, you know, connection issues, or if you need me to pause, just like you know, uh, ping me, and um, I'll, I'll take care of that. Would that be okay? Cool. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, um, Adam, for the introduction. It's really great to be talking to you all today from India. And it's currently like uh, past the midnight right now. Um, but uh, just to give you an idea of where I'm speaking from. Uh, just a little bit about me. I'm a human computer interaction researcher. And my work focuses on accessibility. Uh, the talk today is to give you a little bit of overview about my work on sound accessibility, which is the focus of my dissertation. Uh, and so I thought that I start by telling you about the future that I'm imagining. Uh, so the future that I'm looking at is accessibility for everyone, everywhere. And this is the sort of future that I think would happen. Like accessibility won't be a niche anymore or an afterthought anymore like it is today, but would be integrated by GFAL in every technology for every user, right? It will be impossible to make an accessible interpreter. And I said it because I believe that accessibility affects everyone, not just people with disabilities. Like we all find conversation difficult to hear in noisy bar and doorbell inaudible over a vacuum cleaner running. And what I'm going to do is to put this in contact by showing you an example. And so how many of you have mixed your phone ringing while in shower? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for all that chat. It uh, really helped me understand like where you are coming from. And so, you know, because of all that chat right that I just heard, um, you know, uh, just make me feel like this is something that benefits everyone, like affects everyone everywhere. And so, you know, uh, Microsoft Inclusive Design Toolkit is playing this perspective very well. So, if, you know, for example, you might have um, encounter temporary and situational hearing impairment, like when you have an ear impaction or when you're talking to a, someone in a bar that you find that you're not able to access critical sound information and can benefit from using an assistive technology. Another study by Verizon has shown that 80% of video captioning technology users are actually not disabled. And you know, this is something that we can all relate to. You might have noticed that to rely on captioning when watching Facebook videos on, on mute. And so you know, big tech companies like Apple, Google, and Microsoft have started to realize the broad market for accessibility. And they have started setting up huge departments and instead of focus on the accessibility effort. So you know, very exciting time to get involved in the field. I don't know, myself, I have a range of products in this area. So this product encompasses a wide range of accessibility issues from you know, sound to vision to motor and other disability. And if you look at this table of my work, it is heavily focused on sound. And so why is that? 
because I believe that in my field of human computer interaction, sound accessibility has been grossly underplayed. Uh, think about it. Like if you encounter a deaf person in your life, like what would you say? That you say that maybe they have trouble communicating, right? And so you would design for their communication. And that's what people have already done. Like they have designed for improving the communication with deaf people. But if you look at from a deaf person's perspective, they're really missing some important cues in their everyday life. Like, for example, they are a microwave beeping in their home, or there may be someone knocking at the door, or a thunderstorm happening outdoors, like how loud is the thunderstorm. And so, you know, they're meeting really critical, important town awareness cues in their everyday life. And so I think that it's really important to think about town awareness from a deaf person's perspective, what researchers have actually not looked at. So I think the one big question that I focus in my PhD is like how to provide sound awareness to people who are deaf and out of hearing. And before I delve deeper into this area, I want to quickly cover the prior work in this area. And there had been very limited prior work, only two studies that have examined the sound awareness needs of deaf and out of hearing people in multiple contexts, like in work, home play, and while mobile. But you know, they have examined the kind of sound that people want in multiple contacts, the kind of information about sound that people want, but they really haven't built a working system. And what they found was that the home was the most problematic contact for sound awareness. The people really wanted sound awareness in the home. But you know, so we started with a more a targeted examination of the home environment to provide sound awareness to deaf and hard of hearing people. And because it's really important to look at the user side of things, what we did is we followed an iterative user-centered design process to really explore questions like what kind of sound information do people want in the home? How do they want their information to be converted? What sort of concern may arise when using a sound awareness system in the home? Like for example, these sound awareness devices will be recording sound. And so there will be privacy issues, for example. And, and finally, um, sorry about that. I'm in India right now, and there is a lot of dog barking out, happening out there. And so it's like an example of how sound accessibility affects all of us. Um, I think it'll quiet down in a minute. Sorry about that. And so, you know, a final question is like, how would a sound awareness system integrate into the home of deaf and other hearing people? And so, you know, we followed this whole four year iterative design process to really explore this question from the user side. And so what I'm going to do in this talk is to step through each of the different aspects of the design process. And so let's start with the first two, the online survey and the formative interviews. And our aim with the online survey and the formative interviews was to help identify the sound of interest and the sound awareness need and preferences of the people in the home. And to explore this question, we conducted two things. The first, a large online survey with 201 deaf participants on short questions. And then we followed up with a focus interview with 12 participants for a more detailed examination of the needs and preferences in the home. And so, you know, in the survey, participants gave us ideas about what kind of sound they would want in the home, like fire alarm, a dog bark, and the different kinds of information about sound that they would want, like location, loudness, pitch, et cetera. And to explore like how to convey all this information to our users, we conducted a design probe. And coming to the design probe now, uh, what is the design probe? The design probe is where you give option a different attribute of a design to participants and ask them to choose which option they prefer. And so based on our formative interviews, we narrowed down to exploring five attributes in our design probe. The device to provide feedback on, the output majority to provide this feedback, like, you know, visual or vibration, the type of sound information that people would want, and so on. And so what we did was we showed, uh, you know, options for different kinds of attributes to a participant. And, and uh, well, I'm going to show you what we found. And we found that the participants prefer tablet 
for the feedback device. They provide visual at the output modality and they provide town type, town location, temporal history, both on for the kind of town information that they would want and so on. And so now these founders, they were given that idea about what kind of prototype uh, to explore uh, with our users. And so you know, based on this finding, we built out three initial prototypes. And so these three initial prototypes were meant to show town information to the and other querying people. And to give you an idea of how this prototype came out from our design improv, what I'm going to do is to go back to the findings of our design improv. And so here are the findings. And I'm going to filter the most preferred results, which is like the tablet visual and the and the three times of sound information. And now I'm going to show you like how these preferences informed a prototype, which are shown to be here. And so if you look at it, uh, the most preferred feedback device was tablet. And so these prototypes were meant to show information predominantly on a tablet. And they're also showing information visually, which was the most proper type of modality. And in terms of town information, uh, the first prototype shows the town type very well, you know, the type of town, the clap town. And the second prototype, it predominantly showed the location of town very well. And while the third prototype, it meant to show the temporal history of a town on a wave farm. And so, you know, this is how we reach our initial prototype design uh, from a design for finding. And we can see like how we are really coming at it from understanding our users' needs. So this is why I focus a lot on really understanding what the needs of our users are. And so, you know, now it's time to test the prototype. But before we build our actual system, it's important to test whether this prototype will actually work for a participant or not. So what we did was we evaluated this prototype in a real life setting. And so we designed a campus studio to look like a home containing a model kitchen, a dining area, and a lounge. And then we used actors, you know, like um, actors to act like family members or a roommate. And so these actors, you know, they were uh, doing the daily activities uh, in the home that produced sound, like, you know, uh, pouring a coffee or washing dishes, etc. And we showed the visualization for all the sound that the actors produced to the participants sitting nearby on the tablet here using the three prototypes that I showed to you before. And so you might, you might, uh, you might have a question like how was the visualization actually produced? And so we, we did not have a fully working prototype yet. But what we did is what we, we use what we call a wizard. So wizard is an actual human that acts like a computer. And so this wizard, what the, what the wizard was doing is that they were listening to all the sound that the actors were producing. And they were pressing the button on their laptop, like, you know, dining and the clap and hunting. And they were pressing the button and to trigger the visualization that appear on the participant tablet. And so it was not an actual working system, but something that was controlled by the wizard hidden behind the participant. And to give you a better idea, there is a real life picture that shows a copy for visualization triggered by our wizard. And so you know, this kind of evaluation where we use a wizard, it's called a wizard of odd evaluation, which is the next step in our design process. And so this wizard of our evaluation is a really neat human computer interaction technique that is actually adapted from a movie with the same name. And the wizard here, here is actually a human that performs the difficult part of a system, like you know, recognizing the sound. And so you know to get you get to see how the participant will react to touch the system before actually building it. So, you know, you get to see all sort of problems that a system might produce before actually designing it. And so this is our actual uh, visit of our uh, evaluation procedure. So I'm not going to cover this in detail, but the most important part that I wanted to highlight was that we asked the actors to act a series of scenarios that mimic the daily life of a home, like, you know, going to a bathroom, uh, babysitting, or organizing a house party to identify all potential concerns that may arise with using a system like this in the home. 
and to you know through this scenario participants gave us important feedback about how to design a good sound awareness system like for example we identified all the possible locations in the home that the system should be deployed in uh, if you look at the example of a participant p said i don't want to know sound in the bathroom because of privacy reason and to you know that mean that we do not want to install a system in the bathroom of a user And similarly, there were other participants who told us about different kinds of customization that they would want in an actual system. So, for example, look here. Like for example, for people, they said that if there is a large guest party, please do not show me certain sound, or at night time, please only show me certain sound. And so, you know, we really got some neat ideas about how to design the actual system without actually designing it. and you know identify the problem with the system before actually designing it so that's why i really encourage my students to do this and need visit a pad evaluation now coming to the actual system at by the time we thought that we had a pretty good idea about what the actual system would look like uh, what kind of town to show what location to deploy the system in and so we built multiple prototype of the system and evaluated the prototype uh through field deployment but i'm going to what what i'm going to do is to show you only the one final system prototype today and the this final system prototype contained a multiple of the display installed in the home so these displays are actually microsoft or crypto tablet that are enclosed in a wooden frame to make it look beautiful when deployed inside the home and so what we did is that the display were deployed in different rooms of the home like you non know, living room bedroom etc to send sound activity in this room but the display were connected to each other so each display can visualize the sound happening in the whole home of the user so now a cute thing is that the display look like this recently emerging smart speaker with screen that deaf people have started to increasingly use in their home so we used this with the design that in this way because we wanted to make the people feel like we're not really adding anything to their home but something that can be integrated to the technology that they are already using now this is important when it comes to accessibility because the disabled people they really don't want to feel like they need to use this new device for accessibility it makes them feel up to try and so we really make sure that we were using the device that the people already use and you know to give an idea of how the visualization looks like on the display sorry about that again Imagine that I'm standing in the kitchen and looking at the display, and somebody is calling me from the living room, and so this is how the visualization would look like on the display. So very briefly, there are three parts to this visualization. The top part shows the spatial information uh, about. Uh, the home the picture layout of the home in a floor plan the bottom part here showed the history of sound activity in different rooms and this part on the top right showed the current activity occurring in each room of the home and you might have also noted that we recognize in specific town like you know you can see the peak town been recognized over here and so we recognize the town by training a deep learning model for the 20 town classes preferred by the on our firm people and to do this we use a process called transfer learning uh, where we adapted the model from a domain of video classification uh, to town classification and so why we will use a transfer learning process uh, because for domain that the image the video i believe that people have collected a lot of data like huge data sets for image or video classification but there is not enough data set for town classification and so there is a huge opportunity to leverage the model that have been trained on huge data set for video can uh, classification and transfer the knowledge to the domain of can classification with the less data in comparison 
and to what we did that we were able to procure a model that was actually already trained on a huge video library by Google, uh, the Buzi 16 model, and to the lots of knowledge here. And then we adapted this model to the domain of town classification by feeding in town temples that were collected from online town of library. And so we only needed about 30 hours of audio from this library, like about an hour and a half of each for the 20 time classes. And so, you know, very little data in comparison to what the model was already trained on. And for the input features, we use low dimensional log mile spectrogram. And we did it for two reasons, like first, because log mile spectrogram is generally good features for sound related tasks. This is something that is widely accepted in the ML community, as my machine learning colleagues have shown me. And second, we kept the features low dimensional so that they can help preserve privacy of the user. Like our features could give information about what category of sound might be occurring, like a door knock or speech, but the spoken content could not be recovered. So let's quickly see what happened during a live production. So during the actual real life system use, this pipeline takes in a sound from a microphone. And so we send data from a microphone every one second and sample it at 15 kilohertz. And then we feed it into the model for prediction. So you know, those who are familiar with machine learning, they will be able to appreciate the model sampling and uh, the one second timeline. And we also did some threshold and to filter unnecessary sounds. Like we ignored sounds with low classification competence or those sounds that were that were too tough for the user. And so you know, I covered this part of my work because I wanted to give you an idea of the kind of research that I do. So I use a lot of elements from machine learning and signaling processing in my work to solve real life accessibility problems. But my main area of work is to build and study fully usable accessibility systems. Like that's where my uh, main contribution lies. And so coming to the field evaluation of the final system, we deploy this system for a period of three weeks in six homes in Seattle. And during this three weeks, we measured like how the participant sound awareness changed over time. And so what we found was the two things. The first one was that for sound that the participant already knew, the system gave family awareness about the sound. And so the participant were able to perform the daily activity faster or with it. Like, you know, one example is that what earlier used to happen is that the participant's clothes used to wrinkle in the dryer because they couldn't get to the clothes in time. But now with the system in place, they know that the dryer has ended the cycle and they are able to get their clothes out from the dryer in time. And so, you know, addicting activity faster or with it. But also, what I thought was particularly interesting was that the hometown gave participants awareness about town that they didn't know adjusted in their home. Like, for example, in the case of participant one, this participant was able to know that their whole wedding house was vibrating and making a lot of noise when they were actually walking. Now, this is something that the participants didn't already know. And the system, you know, this helped tell participants about all kinds of sound that they might be knocking that they didn't already know, like putting the cup on the table or, you know, moving the chair too much. And, you know, what's interesting was that some deaf people in our work, they used to think that their home is very quiet because they use sign language a lot. And if you lose sign language, you would think that you're, you know, you're not making a lot of sound. But now with the system in place, they realized they were actually pretty noisy. And so, you know, the system gave them really good awareness about what kind of town might be occurring around them and in the home. So those were the two main advantages that we found with our system. And, you know, naturally, there were also some suggestions for improvement. Like, for example, participants said that the system wasn't viable for use outside the home because it relied on big importable devices. But, you know, naturally, they wanted kind of awareness outside the home as well. And some participants also said that the system needs to support more sound than the 20 it currently supported. 
And finally, I do respect that there was a situation when many sounds were occurring together. Like you know, when there was a house party or whether there was TV running in the background at the same time when the people were talking. And the system did not recognize sound accurately in those, in those situations. And because my work built on top of each other, based on the user's needs, for each of these failures, we designed a new system prototype. And so for the first concern, which is not viable for outside home, we investigated how best to provide sound awareness on portable devices, like, you know, watches or phones. And so again, we followed the same user-centric design process, starting with formative study, design and evaluation of prototype, and finally field deployment. And I was not going to cover this in detail, but I want to point you to the final prototype uh, from this work that we released on the Google uh, Play Store. And so this prototype is a smartwatch app that recognizes this town fully locally on a conventional Android smartwatch. And to give you an idea, I'm going to show you some examples of video of what can use. And so hopefully that will work. You know, sort of get an idea of like how this works. And so this app is something that I'm using myself right now. And it's telling me all sort of a sound that are happening around me. So like, you know, I'm speaking. And so this watch is giving me awareness about speech. And there was dog barking outside when, um, when I'm in the beginning of my talk. And the watch alerted me to that. In general, you know, I use all of my technology that I built for deaf people in my own life as well, because I'm hard of hearing. And so, you know, I use my own personal experience to inform my work a lot. And before I go further, I want to quickly acknowledge the high school and the graduate and master students that I helped mentor, who really helped put the research to a public land. And so they work really hard uh, to release this technology and to huge kudos to them. And one of the striking findings that we noticed from our online app reviews is that there have been cases when some hearing people have also used the app. So example is shown over here. You know, if my doorbell is ringing when I'm wearing headphones and playing video games. And so you know, this app was originally meant for deaf people, but some hearing people also used the app. And so this goes back to the point that I make at the beginning of my talk that accessibility affects all of us and we can all benefit from using technology like this. Okay, so my work has also helped inspire uh, commercial religious. For example, sound recognition now comes integrated by default in both the major mobile platforms, Google, Android, and Apple iOS. And both companies have informed us that our work has helped inspire creation of this prototype. But just want to make it clear that this was an independent work by both these companies. But our work, our work helped inspire creation of this prototype. And so that covers addressing the first concern from a hometown field deployment, the bringing sound awareness to outside the home using portable devices. And if you remember, the second concern was that home sound or even sound work for that matter, do not support enough number of sound. And what I'm going to do is to unpack this for a bit. Uh, so this, 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 system, this system only recognizes like, the top 20 most preferred sound by mm -hmm. deaf people. Uh, but you know, deaf and hard of hearing users could have different needs depending upon you know, their hearing levels or even personal situation. Like some people, um, may have a special home appliance that they want the system to recognize, or some may have an infant. And while, you know, baby crying was not among the top 20 most preferred sound by deaf people overall, you know, which is highly important for some people, we might have a baby. And so what we want to do is that it's to, we want the system to support 
fertilization. Uh, it's important to do that but to support the special cases that the user might have. And so this is also very well explained by a participant who used home sound. The participant said that, that before remodeling the kitchen, we had a porcelain tank and the system will recognize you will leave the water running. But now we have a stainless tank, steel tank, and the sound of water hitting it is very different. So we want to be able to tell the system, like here are some sounds from a new tank, and this should then be able to recognize it. And so what we did, we started exploring personalized sound recognition. And again, we followed the same iterative design process, starting with a, a large online survey with 500 participants, and then investigating several uh, machine learning algorithms for personalized sound recognition. And what we have achieved so far is that we have put a system backend that can support up to five sounds per user with usable accuracy in the real world. And how the system potentially works is that the user will feed in short samples of this five sound, and the system will automatically train to recognize this sound. And so this work was in very close collaboration with the machine learning expert, and I look forward to having such collaboration in the future. But you know, with the problem, the basic problem is that we only have a system backend for now. Now, why is that? Because think about it. How will a deaf user who has difficulty hearing the sound themselves record the sound that they're themselves not able to hear? And so this is one of my future work in this area, like what visualization can help deaf people record sound or what visualization can help them affect the quality of the recorded sound. In general, like how can deaf users train a complete sound recognition system by themselves and so now if you have expertise in design, data visualization, or machine learning, I'd love to talk to you more about that. That's really a pertinent question. Like how can someone who deaf go about collecting their own sound data? And we have already conducted some initial permitted interviews with deaf people in this area. And so we have some idea of what we want to build, but we now need to build and evaluate the system with our users. So if we go back to the hometown field deployment, there is one more future work left, uh, how to handle multiple overlapping sounds. Again, this is something that I would love to collaborate on with people. Lots of interesting questions to explore here, like should we show only the top two or three sounds, that should we show all sounds? Can we combine similar sounds, like you know, a microwave beep and a dishwasher running into a single sound so that we don't uh, overwhelm the user with a lot of feedback? And so a lot of interesting questions to explore here. And if you're interested, I'd love to collaborate with you on this. And so you know, that completes the first big thread of my work, providing awareness about every town to the people. And what I'm going to do is to briefly, very briefly cover the other two threads of my work, which are also related to town accessibility, supporting speech conversation, and improving accessibility of town and emerging technology like AR, VR, or smartwatch. So let's quickly start with one of them, supporting speech conversation. In the thread, what we're exploring is like how we can support speech conversation using head-mounted display. And I'm again going to start with the motivation. Uh, so many deaf and out of hearing people use real-time captioning to act to speech. Like if you're not aware of how captioning works, you could see like Zoom captioning has been turned on at the beginning of the track to give you an idea of how real-time captioning works. But you know, and typically these captions are shown on a laptop or a large screen or on a smart, smartphone. And what happened is that they forced the user to shift their attention towards the caption and screen, drawing their gaze away from the conversational partners or the environment. And that is why what we're exploring is an alternative approach, displaying captions directly in the user's field of view using a head-mounted display in the hope to reduce the visual split and increase glanceability. And we again followed an end-to-one -end, uh, process leading to several prototypes. 
Tatam Prama proof at Kant of localization to an initial Yatin prototype, to a more refined prototype, to a pultatum that it plays localization, captaining and some recognized sound on a head mounted display. Like each of these, um, you know, prototype resulted in a publication in a human computer and Pratham conference. And throughout the process, we increase the length and the breadth of our evaluation. So coming to the future work now, like if you see here, if uh, on my on my prototype, I'm using a very big and bulky macros of Halloran, which is okay for doing short evaluation, but really it cannot be used for long time because it's so big and bulky. And so one of my future work is like how we can make a more bearable head mounted display prototype and conduct field evaluation with such a prototype in the real world. Like this is one of the questions that I'm exploring in collaboration with Google right now. And then a remaining design question is how to show multiple sources of information on a small wearable display. So, you know, combined and localization, captaining, town recognition, all sorts of possible information about town on a very small head mounted display. And so if you are a uh, UX researcher or a designer who is interested in exploring compelling user interfaces for strong sound, you know, let's talk. So that completes the second thread of my work as well. And the final thread deals with improving the touchability of, you know, emerging technologies like AR and VR. And so you know, the first two threads of my work uh, the providing awareness about our day sound and about supporting speech conversation. They were about improving the touchability of environmental sounds and speech, the touchability of physical content. But you know, this thread is about improving the touchability of digital content, like you know, software and app. And what I'm going to do is to cover only one work in this area, which is on exploring how to improve the touchability of virtual reality for people who are deaf and hard of hearing. And so this was a broad collaboration with sound designers, VR researchers and developers and people with disabilities during my internship at Microsoft Research. And as is common in my work, we again started with uh, formatted studies to examine what all risk diversity of sound are there in VR, like you know, time for emergence, time for increase in dualism, and time for common critical information. And then we examine like what challenges do deaf people face when it's touch in this town. <coughs> and based on the findings of this question, we constructed a design space, a thorough design space to map different kinds of town in VR to the corresponding visual and haptic feedback to support accessibility. And then we use this design space to explore several prototypes that developers can use to make their own VR app accessible to deaf people. So these prototypes have been publicly released. You know, feel free to check them out. They're basically Unity modules, like Unity code script that can automatically extract the relevant sound information from any VR app and can map that information to corresponding visual or a haptic feedback to support deaf people. And so, you know, natural future question that arises in this work is like how we can generalize this work to support other technologies and disabilities. Like my work has focused a lot on deaf people, but the underlying technology is generalizable to everyone. And, you know, as I said in the beginning of my talk, sound accessibility affects everyone not just um, deaf people, but also blind people, or those prone to sensory overload, or even hearing people. And we will need to make new front-end user interface for each different disability, but hopefully my underlying sound recognition technology can be reused to support the other use case. And so that's the end of the final thread of my work. I want to briefly cover my future work now, the work I'm going to do as a faculty member. I've already discussed some of it throughout my talk, but now I want to consolidate everything into one frame. 
And what I will do is I would go back to what I said in the beginning, the future is acceptable for everyone, everywhere. Like in the future, I believe that accessibility will be integrated by default in every technology for every user because really accessibility benefits everyone. And if you really look at the history of assistive technology, the world is already moving towards this. Like for example, we initially started with building specialized assistive product with only supported and specific tasks for the user. But recently, what we have begun to see is some crossover between the assistive technology and the mainstream technology. Like noise cancelling technologies from hearing aids have now been integrated into conventional earphones and Apple AirPods. And similarly, voice recognition technology benefits everyone. Like, you know, people who are blind, mobility impaired, or non-disabled users. And so, you know, mainstream products like smart speakers have now been used to provide accessibility. And for my system too, you've seen like how much technologies like Tanwap have been used to benefit hearing people as well. And so, you know, going by the trend in future, I believe that accessibility will be so pervasive that every product or service will be accessible by default. And so now this is a really far away future, but so what do we do to enable such kind of future? Like first, I believe that we need to make personalized accessibility system, a system that can accommodate the needs of every user in different contexts. Like this is both from the software front, like how we can use how we can make personalized human in the loop pipeline for accessibility, as uh, covered in my talk, but also on the hardware front, like how we can make plug and play hardware toolkit so that people with disabilities can use this toolkit to build their own assistive technology. So, you know, sort of moving technology creation into the hands of the user as much as possible. And secondly, for emerging technology like you know, AR and VR, we need to arrive at accessibility toolkit, metadata, or even guidelines that developers can use to integrate accessibility into their app. So, you know, I've been talking to a lot of developers of different technologies, and they really want to make their devices accessible, but they really don't know how to do that. And so we need to come up with the toolkit, guidelines, the standards to help the developers integrate accessibility into their own app. And you know, why do I say that accessibility has been an afterthought? Because companies usually make devices for the mainstream population first, and then they add accessibility feature and top of it. And I really don't think that's the right way of doing things. We need to be thinking about accessibility from the beginning. And with technology like AR and VR, because they are new and emerging, we have a really great opportunity here to do that, like create framework to integrate accessibility from the very beginning. And finally, I believe that accessibility needs a community for creating and deploying technology. It's a very community-driven initiative, like the disability community, local organization, healthcare provider, support services, rehabilitators and such like, and even you, a non-disabled person, everybody needs to work together to provide accessibility. Like a striking example of that is that, you know, people have been uh, very kind to enable captaining in the gym. Like this is an event where like everybody is using captaining. Uh, so sort of like non-disabled people and disabled people are coming in cross collaboration to enable access for someone like me. And so this is also one of the reasons that I, uh, you know, I'm interested in uh, coming to uh, Colorado because there's a lot of wide collaboration that goes on in Atlas Department, Atlas Institute. And so you now I will I will end with a statement here: the future is accessible for everyone, everywhere. And I'm very excited to work with you in getting there. Thank you. Thank you. No. Wow. Cool. Can we start with a question in the chat? David, you want to talk about <laughs> your comment? Yeah. Yeah, uh, should I read it or just <laughs> um 
Yeah, but, but yeah. Uh, hi, hi, DJ. Yeah, I, I teach uh, I teach sound and I teach universal design, but they're two separate classes. So this was a uh, fascinating seeing the two two come together. Um, and uh, I guess I've, I've uh, had a, had a deaf student, and it started with um, how do, how you know how do you wake up in the morning? And she recommended an alarm clock that has vibration and then like flashing strobes. And uh, I can actually benefit from that because I, I you know I don't sleep through an alarm anymore. Um, with the vibration and so that that got me into other haptics like um, a vibrating metronome uh, I have on order it's been delayed for two years but the uh, because of the uh, pandemic but the uh, the sub pack so it's a backpack that um, uh, she used to experience music and that was actually her capstone thesis so she created a bomber jacket uh, that did vibration so she, so she can experience music um, but the commercial product is like the sub pack um, so I was wondering with your your research, if you include haptics like vibration, uh, specifically, I was thinking the house scenario where you needed um, kind of your immediate attention, like maybe a, a doorbell or a baby crying or a dog, dog whining to go out. And so something that the immediate vibration say, hey, I need to pay attention to this. Right. Sure, okay, so very good question. And you know, we were inventing all sorts of haptic devices in the beginning of my PhD. And like you, they tapped during the pandemic, but we were able to like keep some of the threads of research alive. And so in the home time project that I talk about, was the time of another system in the home, the, the part that I omit was that we paired the dick plate with a smart watch that the user also wear. And the dick plate were given sort of like awareness information. Like, you know, we would come back from, from work and we would see the history of the town on a dick plate. And that would give you some information about what kind of sound were happening in your home. But sort of for, for um, activity that require immediate alert, like, you know, door knocking, a fire alarm, the dog barking, we alerted the user uh, through a smartphone that was paired with the phone. And the smartwatch was giving the vibratory feedback and they were prompting the user uh, to look at you know, more information about what kind of possible sound they might be before they would actually be able to talk the sound. And regarding the haptic jackets and, you know, top pack and bomber jackets and stuff, we've also investigated that for VR specifically. And again, because they're, you know, the, the, the jackets are so big, uh, we, we didn't like actually do field deployment with that, but we investigated like how we can pair the VR headset with the display because VR is sort of like already like an artificial environment where you are expected to wear a bulky headset anyway. And so there we paired up with like, you know, a jacket, uh, custom made white band as to a jacket that we used to give like musical feedback and the feedback about background sound while we were given information about foreground sound on the head mounted display. Yeah, yeah, so some definitely some work on that. Thank you. <laughs> There's another question by uh, Mamuna here. I would just like verbalize it for someone who might have a uh, rooting difficulties. Um, so do you plan on expanding your research to other areas of accessibility, for example, designing solutions to visually impaired people in the future? And so, you know, my work has already covered some of that. Uh, if you see at the beginning of my talk, like there is some work in, a like, lot of work in town accessibility, which is my primary focus, but I've also covered some work with visually impaired people and, you know, people who have limited mobility and stuff. So visually impaired people have work on design and indoor navigation system and image classification algorithms and stuff like that. But really what I, you know, what I say that, you know, my work is unlikable to everyone is because I think that town accessibility affects all of us broadly. Even people who are blind, they are subjected to so much information through the sound modality because you know, screen readers and navigation system, they all use sound to provide environmental feedback to people who are blind. They are subjected to a lot of cognitive overload when the sound information is um, given to them. So we investigated like how we can provide sound information through haptic feedback for example, so the blind people would not pay the sensory overload when it comes to the time modality. Uh, but you know, underlying what, what, what I meant to say here is that the, the user interfaces would change for each of the different disabilities that we target. But you know, I hope that the underlying sound awareness technology would be generalized to multiple disabilities and even non-disabled people as well. I have a question. Um, fascinating work and really wonderful overview of a much larger research area than the individual projects. I, I appreciate that. Um, kind of off the wall question, but is there anything to be learned by studying synesthesia people, people who see, see sounds or hear colors? 
And related to that, there's this work uh, by an Israeli guy, and Ellen will remember the name. Ami, um, Amir Ahmedi. Amir oh, Ahmedi, Ahmedi yeah. uh, on seeing with your ears. So again, what, you know, what, what insights are there besides speech to text or sound to text that we can leverage to enrich the deaf and hearing, hard of hearing person's perceptions? Like definitely, so that's an interesting point. I think that you are like uh, to call it to atom, like beyond the technology and awareness, there's also the artistic aspect of like giving to the studio information to people. And one thing that I have noticed in my work is that uh, people who are deaf have heightened perception when it comes to like other non auditory related modalities. So for me, for example, I'm a hard of hearing person and my visual perception is like slightly increased. So my visual attention range is beyond what like a uh, uh, normal um, visual attention range normally is. And so like, we've seen like all sort of like heightened sensory perception when it comes to different disabilities. So people who are visually impaired would have heightened tonic perception, for example, because they're able to hear that. And we've actually tried to design for that increased perception as well. So we've seen like, we can if we can show like background sound, like rough data running or like, uh, you know, like, uh, um, um, I'm pulling a blanket, refrigerator running or air conditioner running on the periphery of a head mounted display so that people are able to like understand like what kind of background information might be there and then show the foreground on a head mounted display. There's a lot of different kinds of work in that area that we should explore. Yeah. Thank you. I guess I, I had I had one more question about the uh, the home system, um, just with you know the um, the smart devices that uh, like Alexis and all all those that um, with the privacy concerns, uh, is your system localized or does it go to a cloud server? Oh, sorry, can somebody help repeat that question? I think that, that the captain would not time type correctly. Um, pri privacy with um, the home the home system, is it localized or does it go on a cloud server that could be hacked and someone could listen in to your home? Oh, oh, but okay. So we have investigated different kinds of architectures and so we have investigated like a fully locally uh, device. We've also investigated like a cloud-based architecture and there's different trade-offs of that. Um, so the one that you saw in my talk today, that was a fully localized decentralized system. And so one of the tablets in the home would act like a server and that would control the information uh, to and from the other tablet. That's what you've seen, but we've also investigated like cloud-based architecture and like a single device-based architecture and look in different products. Like for example, some people want cloud-based because they faster, it can store more data, but at the cost of privacy. And so some people were like, you know, let's just have only the home the base tablet uh, contain all that model running and everything. And so all sort of different kind of products. Um, I think there was a comment by Alan about uh, privacy concerns and Lakta system at home. I can talk more about that uh, if you if you want me to. Time for one more question or comment. Uh, hi, this is Chris Byrne again. I have to. I don't. I don't my picture is down because of my location and my travel and stuff. But otherwise, I just wanted to um, say what a great talk this was. And again, I think the domain is, is um, uh, so essentially strategic. So just you know, as you're talking, and I'm not unfamiliar with the domain, but it, you know, it occurs to me once again that if we can use different devices to, um, to achieve what we do with our natural senses, Right, and we often use words like see or hear to say, I understand, I hear you, I see what you're saying, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really all about that. And um, uh, what's interesting is as you're talking, thinking, well, you're using the microphone as a camera, 
right? And so then you'll see the sound. Uh, and so the opportunity to do that and to do that in increasingly sophisticated ways is so remarkable. I mean, as you were talking, I was imagining, as opposed to just a pad, for instance, you could take the camera, scan a room, and then have a, uh, a soundscape that you can just present to anybody, whether it's on a two-dimensional screen, or holographically or otherwise, and that's, that volume of the sound would be completely displayed as it occurred in real time to the user or to the recipient, et cetera. So you're on the verge of that. It, you know, it's quite remarkable. And the other thing that I think is so multiplicative is all of our different senses sort of inform each other and the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? But your focus on one will end up being so valuable in all the others that, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's just a treasure trove of opportunity. Anyway, I just wanted to congratulate you on the work. And um, I mean, I was just kind of tingling as you were describing this thing, just imagining the possibilities. I can, I can, just, I can just imagine them. Anyway, thank you. What a great way to close. Yeah, thank hey. you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, DJ. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. Yes. Thank you so much for having me. That was really great. And there was so much Mundutin uh, conversation around the Tedia and multi tantri protect and everything. So, really, uh, very uh, thankful to all for having me here. Oh, thank you. Bye.